Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber, joined here on set with an attorney from the Legal Aid Society, Terry Rosenblatt. So great to have you here. We have a lot to break down, and we're going to get started right now. So All right, Terry, you got to love when a defendant takes a stand because you really don't know what's going to come out of his or her mouth. And really, the jury is probably listening to every word, every motion, looking at how he appears. What did you make of that, talking about what he eats and what his belief system is? <laughs> Well, you're right. It's always meaningful when a person who's accused of a crime takes a stand, right? Because it's an insight into who that person is. Um, it's how you see their humanity. It's their story to tell. And it's often a very brave and difficult choice for the lawyer and for the client. Um, what do I make of this? I mean, he seems like there is a lot going on, right? Um, and so where does all of this come from, right? Like where where is, where are his feelings coming from? How is his lawyer communicating that story to the jury? Because that's a really important dynamic, right? How the lawyer is able to tell that story because that, you know, you really have to shepherd your client to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, think about any kind of like, anytime you've been on a stage or public speaking, how scary that is. Imagine you're doing that in front of 12 people who are deciding the fate of the rest of your life. Yeah, no, it's, it's a big decision, a lot at stake here, and he is fighting for his life. Uh, I'm also joined here by former prosecutor Melba Pearson. Melba, it's great to have you here. As a former prosecutor, do you just sit back and you kind of love when a defendant just takes the stand? Because does it help your case? I mean, here, if you're the state and he took the stand, tried to explain away everything, are you just sitting back and saying, wow, that really helped my case? Or did not? You tell me. Well, it depends on the case, right? So in this particular instance, the prosecution is probably sitting back, taking notes and enjoying the show because um, he is rambling a lot. Um, and you see a lot, and I was a DV prosecutor, domestic violence prosecutor, and you see in a lot of those cases where domestic violence defendants tend to get on the stand to try to justify and explain away because their modus operandi is manipulation. So if they've been used to manipulating the people close to them, their partner, their spouse, their girlfriend, whatever the case may be, family members, they think they can manipulate the jury. Um, but I think also from a defensive perspective, it's interesting because of the fact that he kind of goes off on these side rants where he's talking about, you know, not eating meat, which I don't eat meat either. Okay. But that's not exactly relevant in the course of what we're discussing right now. So that, that may be setting up the argument later on, either during closing arguments or during the penalty phase to say that that you know, he suffers from some mental issue or defect and try to convince the jury not to impose the death penalty. So th there could be a multi-layer strategy happening there. See, I was just looking at him, here's a peaceful guy, you know, he loves all God's creatures, he's loving, he's just trying to do the right thing. I think that was a story that I, at least I got from that, but I wanna play a little bit more of Markeith Lloyd from yesterday and you make your own decision and your own opinions about how you think he did, so take a look. Terry, what do you think? You think he comes off as credible? You think he comes off as sympathetic? I mean, he's just explained how he wanted the baby, even if it wasn't his, because he's a convicted felon and he might not have the opportunity otherwise, and trying to paint a picture of his relationship with Sade. What do you think? You know, I think, I think there is a sincerity in what he's saying. And you know, like I said before, there's obviously a lot going on with this gentleman, right? And, and um, there are layers to what he's actually thinking, what he was thinking at the time, what his lawyer is trying to communicate about, um, as, as, a, as um, our colleague said, about his mental state, right? This, some of this may be geared towards what's going to happen at the f penalty phase. But he does not sound like someone who is being manipulative. It sounds like he is being his true self, whatever that is. Well, that's you know, one way of looking at it. We're going to have to see more when he's uh, cross-examined today. But Melba, I want to ask you something else outside of what happened yesterday with the defendant taking the stand. There was also a big development one of, with one of the jurors. One of the jurors was dismissed for apparently overhearing a conversation between another juror and a deputy. Um, and it was about stand your ground laws and how you can get a, a gun license and the judge and, and she and this juror felt that they, they just couldn't be unbiased anymore in this case, that it kind of tainted the way they were thinking, and the judge ultimately dismissed this juror. I'm curious what you think about that decision and also the ability of the juror to come forward and be honest about that. But also, I was surprised that the judge didn't dismiss the juror that initially had the conversation with the deputy. I was surprised that that juror wasn't dismissed as well. 
I'm very surprised by that course of action as well, because the reason why we instruct jurors not to seek outside information is because we want to make sure that they are educated on the law that applies in this case. And stand your ground may not end up being an issue because if not enough evidence came out to warrant that instruction, that instruction may never be given. So now you have a juror that sought outside information and is bringing that into deliberations and may not have the correct view of the law when deliberating and coming to a verdict. So right. number one, the one that went and asked the question should have been dismissed and the one who heard it um, was rightfully dismissed as well because now they've been biased by what may or may not be correct information so right. both of them should have gone but I'm glad that the jury came forward and was truthful because many times those things happen and we never know mm -hmm. and then if the verdict goes you know one way or the other was it really a just verdict did they really make a decision based on the facts and the applicable law in this case I got to give credit to both sides for picking such a juror this is exactly the kind of jury you want who's unbiased and realizes the danger of overhearing these things. Again, I was so troubled by the conversation because this is about a shooting. This is about self-defense. I don't want jurors having any conversation about that. You want to ask about what sandwich you should get during lunch? That's one thing, but nothing about firearms or guns or shootings or anything like that. Well, and we'll the deputy shouldn't have answered it either. No, no, I, that's a it's a whole separate issue. All right, so we're going to take a break. When we come back, keeping a careful eye on the courtroom feed, we have a lot going on here on the network. We'll be right back.